Welcome to the If We Knew Then podcast. I'm Stephen Sox. And I'm Lori Sox. We have the pleasure of being joined again by Julie Pico. Uh, she's a mother of two little girls, Jasmine and Elise. In our first meeting, you may remember, she discussed some of the misinformation she encountered and how she dealt with some of her fears after Elise was diagnosed with Down syndrome. Today, we talk more about future technology, stereotypes, and the dangers of preconceived notions of Down syndrome. Julie, welcome back to If We Knew Then. It's really good to be here. Thank you. It's nice to spend time talking to other adults when I spend all day talking to two little girls. <laughs> yeah, right? Well, we, we always look forward to talking to you. Julie, we had touched on it a little bit in our last conversation, but I was hoping that you would share in a little more detail what your actual experiences with Down syndrome are compared to what you thought or you were told it would be. Yeah, what our experience has been, and different from what we expected, is it's been a lot more happy than we had expected. I guess, you know, there there is so, even with all the research, there is so many unknown unknowns um, that, that after she was born, you know, even though I had this feeling like, okay, she's just going to be a baby for a while. And what does a baby need, but love and, you know, care, um, whatever that might be, whether it's medical or, um, just your typical care, but, um, she just, she's such a, a least, you know, she's just so her and we've just been so happy and, um, I remember reading, I I had uh, somebody send me some information about CRISPR when I was pregnant. And uh, I don't know how familiar, you know, you guys are with with CRISPR, but... One of us is the technology person. (laughs) Say what? I'm raising my hand right now. (laughs) (laughs) I I do know, yes. And the other one is just looking at me going, okay, we'll talk about this later. You you fill me in later. It can find and isolate um, genes or chromosomes and with the potential of eliminating genes or, or chromosomes. And I um, I was looking at that, and I was also looking at uh, surveys that were done with families about CRISPR. And I remember reading one that said that parents who had children with Down syndrome were asked if they could use CRISPR to have reversed their child's Down syndrome, or if they could even do it now, at whatever age their child is, would they do that? And it was a very high percentile, it was up in the 90s, of the parents had said no, that they wouldn't do it. And I just, at the time, I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Like, that's that's really interesting, but I didn't really know how to absorb that. I didn't really put up too much thought into it because I just didn't understand. That was kind of an unknown to me. Right. So, but I thought, wow, that's really a wonderful thing. I, I don't really understand it all. And I wasn't, you know, really looking at CRISPR for Elise, you know, I, I had, that was one of those things where we were already content with her having Down syndrome at that point. It was just somebody trying to be helpful in their way, thinking like, you know, maybe this would be helpful. Plus, you're in a wrong time. You're not. You're not quite there. We're not quite there yet. But right as a as a full option too. You know. No, not at all. And but it is a great hypothetical. Right, and I think that will be something that's posed to a lot of people in the future. But I uh, now I totally get it. I mean, I, I really do. I I feel like what I, there were some expectations on some level. And it's hard for me to really put them in words that things would be so much more different than they actually are, 
that somehow my child would be so much more different personality wise or something you know I, I didn't know it was really hard to understand that and it's not I mean she's a lease and she's um a nut and she's funny and she makes us laugh and she's stubborn and um I just I, we're just happy we're so happy and and that goes back to to you know what I said before about if I'd known then I just gosh it would have been so much easier <laughs> like I just wouldn't have worried half as much I may have read that same article about CRISPR and it led me to another article about just a talking to families that included uh, someone with Down syndrome and, and how they felt about their family. And, and they as well, they had a very high percentage of happiness or what they said, how happy they were. And, and also the individual with Down syndrome, how happy they were about themselves, how they felt about themselves when they looked in the mirror, if they thought they had friends, if they thought they were popular, if, what they thought they could do and what they couldn't do. And they, and it just, makes me go back to something I've said several times where there are things about Liam that I am so comfortable with um, for all the things that we say we are concerned with, you know, uh, that uh, wh how to guide him to adulthood and in education. But things I am, I don't worry with, with him, things I may worry with Sophia. There's no guarantee. I've said this before. There's no guarantee that, that, either one of my children are going to love themselves when they, when they grow up or, or, um, that they're going to be happy. You want health and happiness and there's no guarantee, but I don't stress about it as much with Liam because he, he has something where he is a confident kid and he, he's loved and he, he knows it. And I, you know, I want to, I want to talk about, cause you said the, that the article or the information on CRISPR was, I'm so glad I didn't have, I, I, I don't know about it. Yeah. That, um, that'll freak Lori out I think a that's bit. why, I think that's why he doesn't <laughs> tell me about those things. Cause I'm like, why did you tell me about that? <laughs> that's horrible. Um, <laughs> Anything so, sci-fi related. She's but like, I think go, no, not sci. It's just that, that you would, I, if it was just sci-fi, that would be one thing because there's so, you know, flying cars and everybody's going to, you know, wear aluminum foil type jumpsuits. And I like jumpsuits. But this isn't just sci-fi. This is, again, trying to eliminate Down syndrome. And they're trying to, and it goes from, it goes from a place of fear to say, there's, there's very few other things. There's nothing else that's joyful and good for your life that people go, yeah, but let's get rid of it. The things that they, they want to get rid of are, you want to get rid of that. You know, you want to get that mole checked. You want to, you want to, you know, get some arches in your shoes for your flat feet. That's you, you want to get rid of that. And it's never in a positive con connotation. And I think that's the thing about this CRISPR is it's, it's not being presented by, you know, what we can do is we can help increase the tone. So maybe he doesn't, he can, he'll respond to OT better you know, or any, anything like that, help, uh, strengthen the tongue. So that way speech develops better or the neuro pathways, because there's three neuro pathways in development of speech. So we can work on one of those to, to help him reach his potential. That's not what we're looking at. They're saying, let me help you here. I'm just going to take this away. And why would you take away something so great? So you're looking at, you know, here you have this person on the outside, who's probably someone who loved you, and real or really cared about you that was like I think I can help you and you know and bless you for just having that you know motivation to want to help me but I and I think that where that misjudgment and motivation is is that people on the outside are trying are only coming from their perception and I would venture to say that they wouldn't understand that I wouldn't change my that that would that would take away my son that would make him someone totally different right that would that would change that would that would ch you're not just changing his eye color you're 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 changing who he is you're changing all the good that came from any challenge that he was given and and so and I think that goes back to you change what he taught us too and what what our right. experience is as what well. else what do you what do you what other how are you going to change us because this now you're taking away this gift and I, I really don't I, I think that 
I believe that the amount of people on the outside that would understand what what we're saying by now I wouldn't no way I wouldn't change it is few because I think that there's so much fear out there and there's so much misconception that that they wouldn't understand that and uh just like you admitted that you didn't you, you're you, like I don't know what to do with that because you don't know what you right you're like I don't I have I get that you go, yeah okay but you didn't really understand it till later and then you go oh yeah no I get the answer so I th- and I think that just comes from you know just that m- misperception of what Down syndrome is and and I and I love that I, I I'm so glad you brought you well, brought because that, that up. hypothetical question always takes me to kind of a movie scene of like going now we're flashing back to our child doesn't have Down syndrome and then. Uh, how are we different? How is how is Sophia different? I think I'm shorter. How, how are other family members and friends different? How how would it have changed our entire life? And that may not be for the positive. Yeah. Well, and I think it's a a, a problem that we as humans face is that humans in general seem to be very tribal. And that's why inclusivity is so important because when you grow up with people from different backgrounds, um, different thinking, different all kinds of diversity. The more you have, then when those people or those differences are under attack as an adult, rather than debating it simply on a theoretical standpoint, you're seeing those people's faces, you're seeing your friends' faces and remembering when they were hurt by having those things said to them. And you're remembering what they've brought to your life and the fact that somebody is saying they should be removed or taken away. And that's where we really come to people's defenses because they're part of our tribe then. And something that could take away diversity just for the sake of difference is um, kind of a dangerous thing. Yeah, it is. And I listened to a um, interview with the, the woman who, um, developed CRISPR and she had a very interesting thing to say she was saying she had a dream and she was being brought into a room and they were telling her that somebody was very interested in her CRISPR and she came in it was a dark room and there was a man sitting in a chair behind a desk with a light on him and when she saw his face it was Hitler and he was so eager for her to tell him about her CRISPR and that that really took her back And that she was very concerned with how do we, now that this thing has been created, how do we rein it in? How do we control it? And then the larger question is to, can you control that? That was the lady who developed the CRISPR? Yes. Kudos to her for just even revealing that dream. Right. That's a, that's a great honesty. That's, that's coming from the person who at one point thought it was a good idea. But and I think it probably does have. It is a good idea. I think it It, does have. It has a a lot of positive benefits. That would just you know right absolutely. Oh, so so does atomic fusion too. But that can be taken in in a right way and a wrong way. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Okay. So um, somehow the military is going to get their hands on CRISPR. We know it. Oh, so (laughs) we've we've seen. We've seen the Avenger movies. Um, so your experience, you're saying uh, your experience compared to what you thought it might be is there is more joy? Absolutely. And what did you know about Down syndrome going into meeting Elise? And how has that changed? I feel like you were pretty educated. I was, I guess, somewhat well read on it but I again I stopped researching about four months in and just made myself kind of step away from that but um I didn't have real experience so with down syndrome you know I I had a friend who had a cousin who had down syndrome who I met once I um one time went to a classroom that um had a little girl with down syndrome and 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 helped walk her um to the office and just thought, oh, what a sweet little girl, you know, but that was, that was it. That was the extent of my actual experience. Um, when I grew up, we didn't have inclusivity in our elementary schools. And, um, and in high school, then you had just a little bit of inclusivity, but they were still so separated. And I think that is because so many, especially teenagers in that awkward stage, we didn't, know what to do with it and if they didn't approach us you know like you don't approach them just kind of like 
with any teenager, but also when there's a difference that you're not used to, you feel awkward about it and you're not sure what to do and, you know, no bad feelings, but just what do you do? So there, I didn't have that in my life and I should have, and I wish I had had that. And um, so I, I read, and mostly what you read about is all the, the health issues. Um, gosh, it's like, you know, there's just a huge list of, of health things. And um, so I just was, that's all I knew, really. And that there's a wide spectrum. So it there's no way to know where your child is going to fall on that spectrum as far as like cognitive development or tone. And um, so, gosh, I feel like it's like, yeah, I read, but I still felt like I didn't know very much. And I feel like the best information I got was from my husband's friend who he called when I called my friend, Karen, he called his friend who had a daughter with Down syndrome and, and he was so congratulatory to him. And, you know, it's like, I know this may, I don't want this to seem, you know, impersonal, but I, I kind of get giddy when someone says that they're going to have a child with Down syndrome because I know how much love it brings into the world. And, um, I'm not quoting him accurately, I'm sure, but he, he said to Aaron and then Aaron said to me, and gosh, this just so filled us up. And this kind of fits more with the Down syndrome thing is that, you know, people, when they see someone, cause Down syndrome is for the most part, not, you know, everybody's different, but for the most part, it's visual. You can see them. People know this person has Down syndrome where you may not be able to necessarily look at anyone else and know you know, if they're, if they have a disability or if they're going through anything, right? Um, so people would approach them more readily than they might and smile and say hi, because even though it's a stereotype, their stereotype is like you said, that they're angels, right? That they're, they're, they're just happy, nice people. But in that stereotype, that happiness comes out and that she, their daughter, is friendly, and they're friendly, and they would smile, and his thought was just, gosh, I just wonder sometimes how much more love we would have in this world with more children with Down syndrome, and and even though we knew, you just never know what, who your child's going to be. You don't know. They could be very prickly. You don't know, but um, it really made us go, okay, love and we just really need to hold on to that you know in the end it's all about love anyways for any child and that's probably the closest to what our experience has been with down syndrome really well you understanding the beauty of diversity um and then also accepting the fact that that's not how you grew up it's pretty awesome to think about that your older child is growing up with that and how this is going to reflect in her life and I think that aha moment, whenever it comes, because I think it took us a little while in, in our process of going above everything else, just the love, that just really that you're, you, you really, I mean, Liam will go into the grocery store and, so, and I'll always be like, Liam, st- you don't say hello to strangers, but he'll be like, hey, high he five. Just, he just walks in, you know, he, like waving. It's right around the corner from his school. And so he knows like a lot of people in there. And I think for my personal, I just, oh, inside, first of all, I'm, I, I, I am, uh, I tend to the private side anyway. And so I just, in my gut, I would be like, oh gosh, people, because I've been approached in grocery stores before when he was very young and I'd be like, people are going to think that and now they're going to, and this, and all these things would go through my mind. And here he is just going like, hey, high five, high five. And, and one day I just saw there was these three really cool people uh, in a Whole Foods and they, I mean, you just look and you're like, there's a three cool hipsters in a whole, you know, getting whatever for their lunch. And Liam walks up and he goes, hey, high five. And the change that came over them, that they were just like, yeah, buddy, high five. And it was just like, whatever garbage I got going on inside of me that makes me judge or second guess any of that, if I can't look at the beauty of that moment and go, the world's a better place. Those people are leaving this Whole Foods with a, a, a hop in their step. And even if it was just that one moment, there was just like a spark of, like in Star Wars, I feel as though there was a spark in the universe. 
Let's see. Up, you know, it's just like it's this. It's a great. It's a great, great thing. And if I can put, if I can put the garbage misconceptions that, you know, were spoon spoon fed to me and and uh, and gave me like a little bit of judgment in my core, if I can take those and just just wipe my hands of them, uh, and see the moment that I could go and go, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. What people think doesn't matter. What people see doesn't matter. What I see matters. What he sees matters. What he does with his life, what he believes about himself, that's what matters. And then look at just his pure, like, hey, buddy, high five. I'm not going up to the hipster and saying, hey, high five. But Liam will go up to just, hey, man, how are you doing? He sees someone, you okay? And and he's he was like nine at the time. And, you know, so it's 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 that I think that to that moment where I could I could go. All right. That's it. That's a really good thing. And how can how can it not be anything but good? Right. Right. Just love. Right. And then so what were your main concern, whether it be when you were pregnant or, you know, even now? Uh, or, uh, when, when Elise was born, do you have anything that was, yeah, there were a couple of things that I felt like, um, probably are pretty common for people, um, who are pregnant with children with Down syndrome and maybe even other disabilities. Um, I know that as I was nearing the time when she was going to be born and, um, my doctor wanted to my regular doctor, OBGYN wanted me to consider having myself induced uh, a, a couple weeks early because um, just for safety reasons, because I, as pregnancies go longer with um, Down syndrome, there's a higher rate of, of death than there are for typical children. And I just, but I, And again, this is, I don't want to say anything to make somebody think that this would be the right decision for them because it's different for every single person. And for many people being induced may be very much the right thing to do. For me though, I just knew she would be fine. I knew she was going to come fine. I just knew it was going to be fine. And I, and I had to push back on that and, but she listened and, and she listened to me and sure enough, Elise. Um, was born a day, I think it was a day after or day before, I can't remember now, than um, her estimated normal date of arrival. And then after she was born, I think something that was a struggle for me, and I thank God that she was my second child in this instance, because if she had been my first child, it would have been really difficult, was that after she was born, she, she latched on and she started nursing. But I think because there's a lot of um, information out there about that not always being the case, that um, what happened was nurses and lactation consultants and different people were coming in um, at different times wanting to see her latch on, but I couldn't wake her up more than every four hours. I mean, she just wouldn't wake up. And uh, so they couldn't see. And I'm going, no, she's nursing. She's nursing fine. You know, it's my second child. I know she's, she's fine. And they didn't believe me. And they kept coming in and going, well, can you wake her up? And I go, well, I can try, but she just nursed like two hours ago. Can you just come back on a four hour mark, please? And, and um, my OBGYN came in at one point while she was nursing. It was like, oh my gosh, she's nursing. And I said, yeah. And I was like, can you call and tell my pediatrician that you've seen her nursing because she's nursing but they still wanted to have a lactation consultant see this. And it was so frustrating by day two in the hospital, they were telling me to take syringes home and start syringe feeding her. And I'm going, you guys, and when it comes to data management, I'm kind of um, strict. And so I actually had brought with me, I'm not sure why I decided to bring this with me, but I had written out, um, day the days and times that Jasmine my first child was nursing over the first like week and I had this with me and so I pulled it out and sure enough she was only nursing every four hours and for about the same amount of length of times I said look at this see what I have and I was like she's doing the same thing my first child did 
And they were like, wow, okay, that's amazing you have that, but we still need you to try to take home syringes to feed her. So we go home and we get these syringes out and I'm thinking, am I crazy? Am I losing my mind? Is she not nursing? But knowing that I'm right, but so we take these syringes and I, and you know, it takes, it took like an hour to get her to feed by one of these syringes and I'm crying because I'm tired and you know how you feel with all of this and you know, just a newborn period, you're just exhausted. And um, I'm just like, I'm not going to do that. And so I nursed her and they had me coming in the next day and she was a pound more than when she was born, which is really unusual for your typical child. Usually they do lose a little weight and then they, they gain it back. And so they finally listened to me um, that she was nursing. And I thought, you know, that was really difficult emotionally. And had she not been my second child and had I not been able to nurse my first child, then I would have believed them and I would have maybe given up. That would have been quite the re regression for her too. Right. Right. So I, I'm, I felt really fortunate in that. And then I found later, I was checking on a chart online because we had gone in for some, something. And there it was a note in this chart at the hospital, the day she was born, having problems with nursing, with a latching. And I thought, who put that on there? <laughs> That's why all these people were coming in. And I asked my, my pediatrician if she would have that removed because I don't want that to be included in data sets that then are not going to give an accurate picture. And, and of course, many children with or without Down syndrome have difficulty latching. And, you know, I just felt like even if that was the case, I wish they had been more supportive that rather than just throwing different, because everybody was throwing different ideas and concepts because depending on who was coming in and what they were saying. And, um, I really wish there had been a more supportive environment around the latching thing, period, regardless of the situation. I thought, gosh, you know, anyone going through this is not going to be getting the support they need. And otherwise, I had a really wonderful team and I was very happy with how everybody, you know, treated us. Were they like that with your uh, first daughter as far as so relentless and... No, or... not even close because because she was a typical child and I'm sure of it. Did you say anything to them? Oh, I did over and over again and had that sheet out and um, it was, it really did. It felt like I knew it was coming from a good place. I knew that they were all coming from a good place, but they were all coming at Elise as Down syndrome. They weren't coming at Elise as Elise. And they were coming at me as a, a mother who was delusional, <laughs> not a mother <laughs> who, you know, really had experience with this and was honestly telling them that it's fine. Um, so that was, that was a difficult uh, time just because in general, that's a difficult time and just to have that piled on and top. And I just thought, well, gosh, that, you know, that shouldn't. That shouldn't be the way women experience those first mm -hmm. couple of days, regardless of the Down syndrome. It shows the dangers of preconceptions. You know, you have someone in the profession that has these experiences and they use that so forcefully in, in how they're looking at this new being who, who, who is, is limitless, but they're going to use those perceptions to, to limit. And, well, yeah. Yeah, we did. We experienced that in the NICU where, where Liam was actually alive 10 days without a diagnosis. So we actually watched how Liam as a premature baby was treated. And then the shift when the diagnosis came 10 days later. And there were a couple of nurses that didn't skip a beat. They were just same they, they they went on with exactly the same support and what they were doing and really still you know the fight helping Liam uh to uh fight for his life and then but there was definitely a shift that we saw and felt and it goes back to that you know the impact that it has on you uh because all of a sudden your child isn't the the same child that it was a moment ago or the same child that maybe your first child was that's one that has you know, all the potential in the world. It's, it's now, oh, we know what this is and this is what, you know, and, and so 
that it would be nice if that didn't happen anymore, wouldn't it? If you could just, yeah, you got you, it. Would, I think it would change. I knew it would change my experience just to be able to actually just experience and enjoy my child. Could we take a CRISPR scenario that would actually just adjust? the rest of us to think more openly <laughs> <All right. laughs> about things. Can we go Leave back them. and let's w- fix us. Hypothetically, can we go back and have everyone, uh, all the medical professionals that we ran into or our teachers or whoever, everyone come from this, the best place you can come from. Right. And, and it's funny how you, you say, I didn't want and want it written in the chart that she didn't latch on because, uh, that's, that's a, that's something that we continue to do. Is that's a real that, thing. That's a real thing. And that chart and going real quick, just to flash into school, that's one thing, one sentence, and one reason why if there's a meeting and someone says something or if there's a report and something's wrong, that, that we have, we're meticulous. And no, you're not, you can write that, but right now I'm going to tell you that's wrong. And that's going to go in the chart along with what you've said and along with this proof that that is not an accurate depiction. So it's, it's, uh, it's something that, you know, just, it's funny. It's not funny in the way like ha ha funny, but it's funny how that becomes so important and it shouldn't. And I think that's what creates the mindset. I know in me of, I don't like to care what people think, but there's a certain level of like responsibility that I have to make sure what's written down is accurate because in other cases you could be like eh, i'm just gonna leave whatever's in there whatever they think but that doesn't it's not the situation with liam is like their their opinion weighs heavy and their opinion like with you their opinion of your daughter affected so much your first two days right and to know that you are able to document just as could, much into right. their chart or you their... will always have that input in yes. your child's life you always do and that's one thing i try to encourage parents and and let them know is that you have that input you always have it and and you know you're the parent you you get to say your side it's not just someone telling you what it's going to be it's you saying i understand that you're coming from a good place and this is what you know but this is this is what we're doing and this is the reality of that julie thank you so much again for giving us your afternoon and all your insightful information and questions Oh, well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share with the community and be able to get information that I can use for my little one. Thank you. Please follow us on Twitter at If We Knew Then Pod, and you can drop us a line on our Facebook page at If We Knew Then Pod, or visit our website, If We Knew Then.com, to send us an email with questions and comments. And you can join our mailing list there and get alerts of future podcast episodes. All these links will be added to this episode's show notes. Thank you again, and we look forward to you joining us on the next episode of If We Knew Then.